Ladies and gentlemen, good morning and welcome to a <laughs> special edition of Toxic Happy Hour where we are toxic towards scams that delay the adoption of global sound money. Today, we have royalty in the house. We have Queen Stacy and the Kaiser, Der Kaiser, Max uh, Kaiser. Hi, guys. Welcome to uh, Toxic Happy Hour. What are you guys drinking today? I am drinking a, a, well, I should say a gin and tonic if I were real royalty, but it's a margarita and that is American style royalty. Yeah, that's a Meghan Markle version of royalty. <laughs> I'm drinking my usual quadruple uh, shot, the cold brew with a little um, heavy cream in there and some other goodies. I must nice. say, you know, a lot of people don't do the margarita correctly and I will tell you something I learned in Mexico City from the Four Seasons bartender. And he said that a true Mexican margarita is only equal parts tequila, Cointreau, and some lime in it. That's it. No sugar, oh. no mixer, no nothing. El Mexico. Nice. Mexico. Mexico. We're, we're, we're not even like a minute in. And, and she's dropping like, you know, life advice to everybody that they can move forward with how the perfect margarita but then the show now man live on top. orange filled lifestyle you can't yeah. be orange filled without understanding how to make a margarita mm -hmm. and if you if actually if you join our orange pill podcast telegram group t.me forward slash orange pill we have bartenders in there who teach you how to make orange cocktails mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> noise that's right nice and Poppy, uh, are you going to show us your Indian pale ale today, or what do you got? Yeah, well, look, you know, I just came back. I was out, out skiing there for a bit in Colorado, and I do like the margaritas, but I had an interesting one there that did with not only mango, but with jalapenos. So it had a nice kick to it. Um, it was good. But yes, for now, just a, a nice Sierra Nevada pale ale. It's early here. Got to warm up. Yeah, good idea. Yeah. Thanks yourself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Pale, pale ale is, is, is good. What are you drinking over in uh, D Denmark? Th thank you. Yes, yeah, so I'm in Los Angeles, but uh, I am from Denmark, but I'm having a giant cup of uh, coffee and I'm, I'm going to add a little uh, apple juice to it. <laughs> so there, th there we go. That uh, doesn't look like any apple juice that I've ever had. Well, in, in, no, no. Uh, is it Calvados? Calvados it, is apple uh, liqueur from France. That's right. Um, it, it, this one's from Kentucky, though. <laughs> American style. When in Rome, oh, yeah. do it's the Romans. So yeah. uh, wh what's going on with, uh, with you guys in the Bitcoin space right now? Orange Pill Podcast, whatever. How are you liking the bull run? Shoot at us. Well, I'm just excited because I was just speaking to Adam Curry and, you know, he's been working with the guys from Breeze, that new app, podcasting app. So I'm literally receiving sats right now from people watching or well listening to the latest episode of orange pill podcast episode 33 and like it's live streaming sats right into my zap wallet so uh, i'm uh, loving watching that wow that's that's amazing and um uh, love love the shirt of course stacy and and max you're getting a lot of great comments in the uh, in the chat uh for uh, for the outfit today <laughs> yeah this is my homage to christine lagarde the, <laughs> the best central banker in the world christine lagarde <laughs> and uh this is uh, i hope uh, reminiscent of christine lagarde because she's <laughs> over there at the sb news L'argent tout le temps, tout le temps, l'argent, l'argent, c'est mieux, c'est mieux, c'est mieux. Hey, Ma Max, what do you like the most about the euro now we add it? Well, it's shit. The euro's all fiat money is garbage, man. It's all garbage. It's all, it's all garbage. You know, that's clear. Fiat money is all garbage. It's the devil's currency. The devil came to planet Earth and he printed fiat money to tempt people away from hard money, away from the <laughs> truth. It's the devil's currency. Now, if you look at this really close up, it says toy cash on it. 
So <laughs> I think that's how you could should consider all fiat toy cash. Yeah. yeah and we're going to uh, sell this as an, uh, you know, uh, on scarcity. Yeah, a absolutely. There's only 1 trillion of them or something like that. <laughs> so, um, Poppy, you want to jump in with something yeah. here? Oh, I do. Um, I'm Poppy. Puppy. Oh. Puppy. 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 I'm Puppy. I'm Puppy. It, you, so, you've lived in Los Angeles, but I haven't really picked up the American accent yet. Like it's like too, it's too pop, like crisp. You've got to be like Puppy. Hey, Puppy. Oh, hey, 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 hey. Yeah, hey, Puppy. Uh, over there at your closet. <laughs> uh, no, that's that's not even American. I can't speak American, Stacey. I, I apologize. I'm just an immigrant, you know. I came here for the for the plastic money and realized it was terrible. Uh, you, you you came here for the stimulus check back in April, which if you had put that twelve hundred hours in, if you would have put that in, in April, your twelve hundred hours stimulus is now ten thousand. So well done. Uh, yeah. So you know you know it's funny. Uh, listen to different podcasts and, and um, following you guys. Obviously, fiat, as we all can agree upon, is absolutely worthless, but Max, I, I thought it was an interesting story because how, how long you, ago you started with Wall Street and working there. But when was one time you actually realized the entire thing was a, a scam? The entire thing was shit. What, how old were you when you realized it was shit? I, I when I was a kid, I used to throw money in the in the streams and throw it away. And I've been doing it since I was five <laughs> or six years old. I hate I hate the the whole concept of uh, of it representationally. Of anything, really, it's there's so much more in the collective unconscious. You know, we can communicate better. You know, money is a terrible form of communication. Words are a terrible form of communication. Uh, you know, we just need to uh, exist on that sixth plane. Sixth plane? What are the other five? <laughs> you know, the five <laughs> planes are pretty well established. Maybe the fifth one is less so, but the sixth one is where all the real communication takes place, the synchronicity, the simultaneous consciousness, the coming together, the union, the fusion of truth. And Bitcoin is the monetary unit of fusion. And once you enter the sixth plane and the global unconscious, you, 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 you see money and you puke. It makes you nauseous. I have to say that Max ripping money up on stage is a great communicator. So it does help you tell a story. It's 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 a story because people have a, a, a they're, they're they're bound to since birth to believe in this this devil symbol of the devil, and uh, so when you rip it up in their face, it repudiates their existence in real time. They get nauseous at first, like doing mushrooms. You get nauseous at first, and then you start to see the reality of it. So when you rip people fiat money in their face, their first reaction is to vomit. After which they start to see the truth. You, so, you know what's brilliant? Do you put? Uh, no, I was uh, just going to say the brilliant, the brilliant, <laughs> the brilliant part about it. Here, here's the brilliant part about that is, like you say, we're, we're full because you know I was born a year we're we're taken off the gold stand. We are a generation that has been swimming in a sea of fiat, and how conditioned we are to find value in it. And yes, it's quite shocking we see someone that can rip up a hundred dollar bill. And then once you see it in two pieces, you realize, Jesus, it's a piece of paper. That's it. Yeah, it breaks the connection to your belief system that it's worth something more than just a piece of paper. So I figure I must have ripped up maybe fifty thousand <laughs> worth of uh, of uh, fiat money over the over the over the last ten years, I'd say. But uh, so. It's it's expensive advertising for Bitcoin, but you took one for the team. There's no doubt that that's. I mean, it's something I remember. Most people in Bitcoin, I think, remember seeing uh, you you tearing up a dirty fiat currency, Max. So, um, do you think that um, that that the, the central bankers understand that they're evil and doing something evil? Uh, are they fully aware that they're destroying? um the, the the basis for like um good of humanity and a decent society mm. most psychopaths are not aware that they're psychopaths whether it's charles manson or jerome powell or christine Lagarde, they don't realize that they're psychopaths and that's what makes them very effective psychopaths they have no empathy they have no morality they have no ethics and that's what makes them dangerous 
And then society caters to them because they print the free fiat money to bribe the weak willed and the mentally feeble to become their cohorts and join the army of the dispossessed and the nightmarishly fiat addicted. And then this is the basis for their, their, their reach into society. But Bitcoin is uh, essentially like kryptonite. It, it just fucks with them badly and is killing them all and they're all gonna get wiped out. They are, and it's beautiful. It's finance, as I say, Bitcoin is financial poetry. Uh, what about you, Stacey? Um, do you think that the, the central bankers are aware that they're just uh, evil people running an evil scam destroying humanity? Well, I have to say, while I'm drinking this margarita, I may have swallowed a worm or something because I look over at Max and I just get the giggles because he looks like something out of Andy Warhol's factory. And I feel like I'm having flashback to the early days of, of all fiat uh, global world. <laughs> I can't even look at him without laughing. It, does he look like from the 70s on screen as well? I can't tell. I'm from the 70s. Oh, right. But I what I, what I think is um, we're getting a, a sneak uh, preview into the next James Bond. Um, he is the bad guy. He is the bad guy. Um, <laughs> do you have a, a cat you can pet or some other pet around Where there? Plucky. Where's Plucky? Yeah, Plucky. Let's get Plucky in there. Where the, is perfect, Plucky? the perfect The perfect. The perfect. Um, bad guy for Bond. Let, yeah. Let's see it. Plucky is a central here's, banker. Here's Plucky. Plucky is an economist. <laughs> There, Plucky. Nice, Plucky. <laughs> oh, my God. Max, why are you wearing those red glasses? Plucky, behave. Behave, Plucky. <laughs> Calm down. Yeah, he's a nice, nice guy. He's a world-famous economist, Plucky. He's been plucked so hard by Christine Lagarde. Look, look what she did to, to poor Plucky. Look, look at what happened to Plucky after Christine Lagarde plucked him so hard. Oh. Look at that. Oh, poor Plucky. I've poor, got to take a photo Plucky. from my angle just so uh, I'm going to. Yeah. I'm going to compare hey. it to that because uh, <laughs> he's so disturbing. Is it? <laughs> he looks like, you know, one of these. Um... <laughs> oh, my God. You look Don't like worry. something. There's, like... No, there's no need for a punchline or anything. You look like Me a combination either. of Halston meets, <laughs> you know, <laughs> who was that woman married to um, Mick Jagger and uh, Jerry oh, Hall. Yeah. No, no, the one before that, the one that, that rode oh. into Studio 54 on the horse. Bianca oh. Jagger. Bianca. Bianca, yeah, okay. Yeah, Halston oh. and Bianca had a love child. That's me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's disturbing. I don't know. It's just, it's. I think I've captured the essence of the money printers. <laughs> Absolutely. So, Actually, so, go ahead, Bobby. No, I was going to say, so if you can to rank like bankers and and heads of fed between pal uh lagarde that that fat guy who i can never remember his name uh, yeah how, how, how do you rank them in terms of evilness well karstens is like the the uh the guy who is at the top of the evil empire he's the eyeball at the top of the of the pyramid and um, so he in, he obviously has uh, the psychopathology uh, uh, that extends out into many areas, yeah. including an in incapacity to put down any donut that he might see <laughs> that comes within 500 yards of that guy. You know, he, as I've said uh, before, he's he has impacted stools in his anus that are bigger than his head. Right. So he, he's like a walking shit bag. He's got like. <laughs> 80 pounds of fecal matter stuck in his colon for 20 years. Uh, and then he gets on TV and um, he talks about uh, policies and he talks about Bitcoin, but when he needs an emergency operation to remove that feces from his colon. Uh, so we don't have to worry about him much longer because he's a very, very unhealthy guy. Uh, then next down on the pecking order, I would say would be Christine Lagarde. I believe she is evil incarnate in many ways. Uh, she um, doesn't have any uh, fecal matter impacting her colon, but she has her head up her ass, uh, which is slightly different uh, proposition in terms of the relationship between brains and shit. So that's uh, Christine Lagarde. But she is a convicted money launderer. So, you know, it, it, yeah. I think it helps her yeah. with the job. Um, I think that probably the most evil, because he understood completely what he was doing, is Alan Greenspan. 
You know, he's not a wow. Keynesian. He's not somebody with impacted feces. He's not like brought up yeah. on, on, he didn't, he never believed in the, in fiat, uh, when he got the job and uh, he, so he understood what he did. He understood what he was doing yep. with the moral hazard, with the Greenspan put I intervening in markets to rescue a few cronies of the government or central banks. So he understood what he was doing. Mac Max was there when he first intervened the very, very first time in a major way, which is 1987 and the stock market crash. Yeah, that's right. That's right. That's right. I was working a, as a stockbroker on wall street in 1987 on Greenspan Robert Rubin and Ronald Reagan created the Working Group on Finance, as it was called, later to be called the Plunge Protection Team. So that was the first time the U.S. government actually started buying S&P futures as a way to manage the, the stock market. And it set off this period, which became known as the Greenspan put. So anytime the market dropped, Greenspan and his plunge protection team would buy up stocks essentially. So the stock market price discovery as mechanism was overridden by the feds. And this became the Bernanke put, became the Janet Yellen put, became the Jay Powell put, became the Christine Lagarde put, became the Karstens put. We've got a global central bank put. They have a printing press. They will never let bonds or stocks go down as long as they can buy them with their printed money. They're Keep doing this. And that's why Bitcoin is at $57,000 per coin, because it's telling us that all of that paper money is worthless. All paper money right now is in a hyperinflationary collapse against Bitcoin. That's happening right now. People say, Max, when's the collapse going to come? You've been talking about it. It's happening right now. That's what Bitcoin is telling us. It's a price signal. And it's slapping you in the face like a wet fish. And you're sitting there like, when's it going to happen? It's happening, dude. If you don't have Bitcoin at this point, you're, you are, um, uh, you are, you should check yourself into the cemetery because you're dead. I, I, I couldn't agree more. It's, uh, it is, it is happening. We're watching it. Um, and you guys have both been doing, I would say, mankind a favor by preaching Bitcoin uh, since Bitcoin was one dollar. Uh, you, you guys um, are real OGs in the in this space. Um, but what I would love to know is, how did you guys meet? <laughs> well, it all started on February 13th, 2003. And I walked into an internet cafe in the south of France, a small town called Villefranche-sur-Mer, where I had been living for a few years already. And uh, the guy who I knew was running the place said, oh, Max, you should meet Stacy. She's a writer. You know, very interesting. And uh, that was uh, was the beginning. We have been inseparable ever since, since uh, February 13th, 2003. Was it a Friday, the 13th? <laughs> no, no. But it was a day before Valentine's Day. So. It was kind of awkward because the next day, of course, I wanted to call her right away, but I thought that would be presumptuous because I just met her and, you know, uh, I, I, I didn't want to appear presumptuous. So, but on the February 15th, I called her right, right away. First thing in the morning. Hello. Yeah. So, uh, we just got, you know, that's how it all started. And we, we spent, uh, how many years in uh, Villefranche? About a year and a half, almost two years. And then, um, we, we started making a podcast together in March of 2003. And that was before there was RSS feed, uh, the RSS 2.0. So there was no such thing as a podcast then. But we, uh, so we would create these, uh, we did a little radio show essentially. It wasn't, so there was no word for it other than a radio show. And um, we had to make sure it was under five megabytes for the file because everybody had dial up back then. So it, it like a, a four megabyte file took about 10 minutes to download. So uh, <laughs> those were the days that, mm. uh, and it took a long time to upload as well. So we had to host it on our server and then provide a hyperlink to it. Um, that was the only way to link back then. So we were making these podcasts and um, somebody from who, was at the BBC and he then uh, founded Al Jazeera English. He was one of the launch team. He was listening to that podcast. We didn't know. And he contacted us to make uh, a documentary on finance for Al Jazeera English's launch week. 
So that was called Death of the Dollar, and Max was the one that presented it. I wrote it, and we had our, the same guy who edits the Kaiser Report actually edited that one. So well. that was about 2005? That was 2005. That, yeah. yeah. So, and that, so the theme was very much from the very beginning has always been about the evil of banks, central banks, and fiat money. And uh, that's been the theme throughout. So in, when we started covering Bitcoin in 2011, it was just, we were just, we, re we recognized it right away as being, okay, this is the antidote. This is how you fight. It, it's like gold, but it's better than gold. You know, we, we had been talking about gold and silver a lot until Bitcoin came around. And then we, we kind of moved over to, uh, to Bitcoin and got a lot of hate from the gold community at that time. You know, that was like Bob Dylan going electric. Uh, you know, they were like, oh my God, you evil bastard. How could you go into Bitcoin? It's just shit coin. But um, because I had a background in technology and in uh, creating exchanges and inventing digital currencies back in the 90s, I, I recognized pretty quickly what was going on here. And so I had a lot of confidence in it. Also, you wrote the white paper and published it in uh, October 2008. Is that is that correct? <laughs> no. No, I mean the thing about what I what I was doing in the '90s with the Hollywood Stock Exchange and the virtual specialist technology, which has a patent that was eventually sold to Cantor Fitzgerald in 20, 20, uh, 2001. But um, the it was all all the digital currencies at that time were centralized. So with Bitcoin, it's decentralized, really, and that's that's really the uh, the magic the magic of it that's the the quantum leap that's the the difference of it you know uh, you know the, the my technology is you can you can see that to create digital scarcity in 1996 when i invented this technology it requires um a lot of um uh, of uh, it's quite a, a a stack of 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 tech to kind of create the scarcity if you will. So when, when Bitcoin came around, you know, I was like, wow, you know, that solves 90% of everything, you know, the problems that, that I was trying to do and solve with uh, the virtual specialist technology. And uh, so here we are a trillion dollars later. Yeah. No, when, all... when I first when okay. the very first episode we ever did on Kaiser report about Bitcoin was early 2011 and John Matonis had written to me, you know, he had been working at Hushmail and um, he reached out and said, you know, have, have you covered Bitcoin yet? And I was like, no, I don't know what that is. And um, he said, well, I'm going to be in Paris in like uh, six weeks or so. And do you want to cover, do you want to interview me about it? So I told Max, I said, oh, you're going to be interviewing this guy named John Matonis who has something that's like the Hollywood dollar. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So that's how I like I, I didn't know what it was. I was just like it's it's like a, a digital currency like the Hollywood dollar. <laughs> yeah, I mean so with Bitcoin essentially it's cleared every 10 minutes or it's audited every 10 minutes or there's a new block every yeah. 10 minutes and with the Hollywood uh, dollar and the Hollywood stock exchange prices were cleared every 60 seconds. So every 60 seconds um there's a clearing operation that takes place and matches all the buys and sells and and it creates the the price, the current price, there's price discovery going on, but, um, that, the, how the, the formula that goes into creating price discovery across 5,000 different virtual securities, movie stocks and star bonds, as they were called, uh, using a virtual mm -hmm. currency, you know, it's a somewhat complicated piece of technology. It took several years to develop. We spent a lot of money. We raised $40 million in VC capital. Uh, we were going to go public and then uh, Cantor Fitzgerald kind of jumped in and gave, made an offer and, and bought the whole thing. They moved the entire thing to the top floor of the, of the World Trade Center just three or four months before 9-11. So 9-11 um, wiped out the Hollywood Stock Exchange. That's why it's yeah. you don't really hear about it much anymore. It's because 9-11 killed it, more or less. And uh, but the but the, but the technology, you know, you can still find the patent online and it's still go through it and you can see my thinking at that time and what I was uh, experiencing uh, in applying uh, what I knew from Wall Street because I'd worked on Wall Street for many years. So I, I took that and I codified it and did the um, architecture on this technology and, uh, you know, 
you know, it's I'm still, just reading still the good. comments. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, that's fine. People wondering, just tuning in and wondering if Andy Warhol's on the show with Stacey Herbert. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, I saw Andy Warhol once at a restaurant in uh, the Greenwich Village called Texarkana back in 19, so, uh, maybe 1980, I think. Mm. I'm, I'm, I'm glad you brought up. I was, I was I was working as a go-go dancer at uh, a lesbian bar <laughs> on Sixth uh, Avenue and Ninth Street called Trudy Heller's. It was a bar. I was working as a bartender, and then they had go-go <laughs> dancers there. And then the, yeah, I would fill in for go-go the, the guys when they were on break. So, um, but I was mostly and I did a, a Tuesday night. I did a, a showcase for comedians, a comedian showcase there every Tuesday night called Mixed Nuts with <laughs> with uh <laughs> mix nuts with max hey, you brought up 9 11 and i'm always curious about this man i'm i'm, I'm a, a a big uh conspiracy theory junkie on this so oh, no. hey let's tie in let, let's do this golden thread this golden thread of let's say 9 11 2008 and a pandemic Let's, let's do this golden thread of how each of these use cases what were. To the guy? He disappeared. He, he, he didn't want to hear a conspiracy theory. He mentioned 9-11 and they opened the trap door. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Thank you. So, uh, you know, going back then, yeah, all of those, as a conspiracy theorist, you, you can go back and it's some, it's some way to hide what they've done to the money. They hid the money somehow at these major events. Um, I, I, I thought it was fantastic. Uh, 2008 was the, the one year that my eyes were really open. The first time the Americans or anyone heard about these things called collateralized debt obligations. <laughs> this kind of bullshit. The way they could hide things. The way um, Wall Street would, well, if they, don't, if they don't give them that AAA rating, we'll just go down the road and get it. I have a conspiracy and theory to link Andy Warhol into it. Really? So Max was just talking about his technology, that, that virtual specialist technology. And what that does is uh, it, it's a virtual market making function, which provides a price to um, intangible things like fame, buzz, you know, uh, just rumors and, and, and just like vapor, essentially. So his patent is referenced by the likes of uh, BlackRock. Uh, JP Morgan, when they built their they built their derivatives algorithms upon his plat his his algorithm that his technology. Mm -hmm. So the the explosion in uh, derivatives around the world started from 2000 mm -hmm. with the Commodities Futures Modernization wow. Act, but that uh, technology was built upon Max's technology. Yeah, also the David Bowie bonds. You know, people. David Bowie sold $50 million worth of his catalog income as a Bowie bond. The guy who, the banker who, who uh, packaged that deal got the idea from the Hollywood Stock Exchange. So we, we influenced the Bowie bonds and that whole idea of packaging intellectual property and pre-selling it. Um, and so we invented the prediction market industry. Before the Hollywood Stock Exchange, there was no such thing called the prediction markets. They did not exist as such. So that was the first commercial patented prediction market of 1996, 1995, 1996. So we invented prediction markets, securitizing intellectual property, digital currencies, uh, virtual securities, virtual currencies, and virtual market making all, all in one year. So that's, I mean, that's interesting. I didn't know the David Bowie bond was inspired by Hollywood Stock Exchange. And then Bob Dylan, just this past month, sold his entire back catalog for 300 million based on the Bowie bond. So yeah, the Bowie it, bond was, uh, it was, was a great achievement for packaging intellectual property. And then I think Neil Young just packaged his catalog as well. And so, but also like, um, oh. you know, in terms of the conspiracy theories, I think it's just, imagine if I were put in charge of flying, uh, you from Los Angeles to Miami for the conference. Now I'm, I'm like, I'm likely to um, press a lot of the wrong buttons because I've never flown before. But imagine if you could find a way to uh, capitalize on every every time you fucked up that you got to print a whole bunch of money for all your mistakes. And then you would mm. start to realize that every time I mess up, wait, I get richer and so do my friends. Let's mess up. Like you're, you're it's not like maybe, maybe they're not intentionally messing up, but they're not disincentivized. They're like, well, what's the yeah. worst that can happen is I crash the economy and I get richer. 
Can't follow the guy, money. Right? Yeah. 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 So, yeah, so that- I think it's it's just that that like it might not be like consciously um, uh, uh, incentivizing them, but it definitely is somewhere subconsciously that they, they, the rich keep on getting richer every single disaster. You see that this last year is the most remarkable in terms of how wealthy the top, well, the few, the top few billionaires became. Yeah. yeah what do we call it? Uh, UBI for the rich on this one, right? UBI yeah. for the rich. Well, that's they the same just literally- thing as uh, the Greenspan put, or the what we just described. Yeah. It's UBI yeah. for the rich has been going on since Alan Greenspan, since since the Reagan years, Reagan and the Thatcher, Reagan Thatcher era, where it was the beginning of this trickle up economy, and UBI or, or uh, you know for the for the top one percent, the financialization of the economy, the uh, ability to um, print money. It, by the by the trillions and yet make sure from a financial and engineering point of view that it never touches wages i mean that's 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 the key that you have to think about that you have to be able to print trillions of dollars but make sure that that the wage earners never see a, a rise in wages so that yeah, that's, that's they, really the magic of it and the way that they do that is yeah, by yeah, constantly understating inflation and saying inflation's running at one to two percent oh. And so for that reason, we need to keep printing money and we need to keep uh, a, an interest rate available at 0%. And that 0% interest rate is only available to our friends. It's not available to workers. <laughs> workers have to pay 18% or higher. But if yeah. you're in the banking industry, you get to borrow money at 0%, which is to say you get free money. And, right? and also you have to look at three very important things that happened under Bill Clinton and it happened exactly with his last year of his administration. We had the repeal of Glass-Steagall. Hmm. We had the introduction of the Commodity Futures Modernization Act, which legalized uh, gambling through derivatives, essentially. So look at the size of the derivatives market from 1999 versus 2021. It's like parabolic beyond anything ever seen in nature. And then the um, the elevation, remember, it was Clinton who started the whole run of putting China into the WTO on favored nation status, where they got to charge us tariffs, huge tariffs, because they're a developing nation, and, and they still get to impose tariffs on us, but um, we can't impose them on them. That enabled, as Max is saying, they can't have, uh, so with all that money printing, Glass-Steagall separated the wall between the banks and their customers' money and gambling. The gambling allowed from the Commodities Futures Modernization Act and all of that stuff they could do, but they had to make sure the wages don't rise, and that was ship all the jobs to China. That's a great way to contain that inflation. Mm-hmm. Yeah, 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 yeah. So here we are with Bitcoin at 56, 57,000 heading to hundreds of thousands of dollars mm. per coin because it's you've got real price discovery there and it's mm. the only asset not in a bubble. It's the pin. It's popping the other bubble. And um, you see so many people now are starting to realize how wrong they were about Bitcoin and they're coming over to the Bitcoin camp. Eventually, everyone has to come over to the Bitcoin camp. It's just a matter, as somebody said, whoever said it is was a great quote. You you end up buying Bitcoin at the price you deserve. That is to me it is absolute an absolute uh, truth, a law um, of physics. You get it when you get it, and you get it at the price you deserve. This is yep. so true. Yep. Um, yep. And I respect the fact uh, you know the pe- people that were you know the OG like you that fuck it understood it took a chance got it in. Um, you know, your cypherpunks, everyone else. Um, after that, speculators. After that, you go down a list. I love I love the fact that it's the people that either took a chance or adventurous or were smart and understood the technology and they got there. Because guess what? Do you know who I want to be in control of the money moving forward? I want people that are smart. <laughs> I want people that take a chance. You see? Because they're gonna they're gonna spend it wisely. Yeah, yeah but no, no, not, nobody's in charge, right? I was no, just gonna say, yeah, that. nobody's <laughs> running the money. Yeah. So the problem no, 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 is no, not, not, I'm sorry, not in charge, but the ones that have the most of it, the ones that have the most of it are going to do the best things with it. Yeah, I mean, unlike fiat money, though, it, which 
you have concentration of fiat money accrues power and power means you can change the politics and get more fiat yeah. money with bitcoin it doesn't matter how much bitcoin you have you can't change the protocol and um so everybody is kind of equal in that way and i think the concept of money itself is going to change i think the concept of being wealthy is going to change i think that the rush to conspicuous consumption would be diminished tremendously. <laughs> and we already see the millennials, you know, you, you look at Bitcoin, Twitter, the millennial generation, they're, they're showing off their beat up cars. They're showing off their, they're selling their chairs, right? They're taking this idea that frugality is actually a good thing. And yeah. I've got money for my heirs. I've got money for my kids. I've got money for my grandkids. They're making sacrifices today for their future generation. Now, I grew up in the 60s and 70s. I'm the last of the boomers. And that's the complete opposite of what I grew up with. My generation grew up with spend it, you know, fake it till you make it, shop till you drop, and um, wearing a power tie, having a power lunch, right? Just uh, basically flaunt it. Poverty Sucks was a poster that was popular in the 70s. And um, this is uh, this led to consumption, over-indebtedness, loss of values, loss of ethics, fiat money, nightmarish societal breakdown that we're in today. Obesity is a direct result of this. And over-financialization and this huge wealth and income gap. So the millennials are already on the edge of another wave that is going back to values that you would associate with the founding fathers of this country, like Ben Franklin, who said a penny saved is a penny earned. I mean, that's absolutely true. A Satoshi saved is a Satoshi earned. So I have a, a question real quick on this one, because Max, of course, you know your history and all that, but I'd like to go back to the founding fathers because, man, aside from the Federalist Papers, uh, you know, the views between Hamilton, um, everyone else on what is sound money at the time, they would be Bitcoiners, I believe. What do you think? Right. Well, uh, according to Ben Franklin, one of the top reasons America had the Revolutionary War for Independence was to get away from the Bank of England. You know, the Bank of England yeah. was a trans tra transitionary institution between feudalism and post-feudalism or the Enlightenment. So it was a way for the elites to control the money, but without having kings necessarily in place. So they went through the Bank of England. The Bank of England is the serves the monarchy of its day by um, controlling money. And so in, in the colonies, uh, the, the, col the, the colonists ended up um, forsaking the script from the empire and they started using Indian money, the wampum, the from wampum. The local Indian tribes, which they could produce themselves. And the, the 13 colonies began to flourish and they started to race ahead economically. And that's what caught the attention of the Bank of England and the, the empire was that, wait a minute, we need to, we need to shut this down. You, so we're going to make it illegal for you to use that wampum. You got to go back to us using our currency. The, and the, economy, the economies went immediately to shit. And then the colonists were saying, you know what? Fuck you. We're going to break away. We're, you know, we're doing a hard fork from your empire. <laughs> we're going to start our own country. And, uh, you know, we send over all, all the red coats you want, you know, because we're going to just shoot them all. Yeah. And ben, and they're Frank gonna ben, ahead, Franklin is, ben Franklin is like a real um, OG Bitcoiner. If you think of how he was a totally self-educated polymath, like he dropped out of school when he was like 11 or 12 and totally educated himself with such a great uh, orator, writer, thinker, yeah. inventor. And he did all of that, you know. A lot of the other founding fathers were like extremely well educated, but he just did it himself. So it was a he's he's like a cool he's like kind of because he wasn't ever a president, like he gets kind of overlooked, but he was really important. You know, where I am um, quoting actually everything I have just uh, <laughs> spewed. It comes from an essay by Nick Zabo called The Origins of Money. He published it in 2002 yeah, and is considered to be one of the foundational essays leading up to bitcoin oh. in, in in the cypherpunk uh no, Nick, group of folks and uh, i recommend said, everyone take a look at that essay it's about 20 pages long or so but it it really uh it, it uh it's it's great foundational piece of education to get into bitcoin 
And by the way, just reading through the comments and uh, the, the, <laughs> the Bitcoin toxic trolls and stuff. Um, <laughs> of course, Ben Franklin himself was also a famous troll. And when he was a teenager, like 12 or 13, he pretended to be this woman who wrote these like obnoxious letters to the editor of the local newspaper. So I, I that because they're actually quite funny. He was uh, he was pretty funny about comp his complaints to the, the mayor and the in the city about uh, various things that he saw wrong with everything. Yeah. Uh, he was an entrepreneur and he believed in this kind of what we today called individual sovereignty. I think, uh, it was, that wasn't a term used at that time, I don't believe, but it would be resonate. He was, he was like the grisage of the day. Yeah, grisage. <laughs> grisage. <laughs> grisage. But, uh, he was like the grisage of the day, but with better memes. Can we agree <laughs> upon that? I don't know if his memes were better, but he certainly... Oh, I guarantee play. they were. I guarantee. Oh, really? the, uh, the whole kite thing. Yeah. Like yellow pop cat should be flying a kite someday. And one, one of his get electrocuted <laughs> like Fritz, the cat, remember <laughs> Fritz, the cat, that was a great, that would never happen today. You know, Fritz, the cat was uh, Robert Crumb oh. comic books from, I guess he was active in the sixties into the seventies, but you know, they got cats pissing into electric typewriters and electrocuting <laughs> themselves. And, you know, I mean, and it's just, you know, it's totally, um, you know, uh, outrageous. And and so you just don't see that level of outrageousness anymore because we've entered a period of cultural Marxism or cultural revolution, you know, it's happening in the U S yeah. right now where everyone has to bow down to the collective. And the idea of individual sovereignty is being pilloried. You're getting vilified to, to have those ideas, even though it's the basis mm -hmm. for the American success story is, is the risk taker, the entrepreneur, the Chuck Yeagers, the, Buzz Aldrin's, the Neil Armstrong, yeah. the Thomas Edison's, the Steve Jobs, the Elon Musk's. I mean, uh, if, if if the current wave of collectivism wins, then we're all going to be wearing little uh, army jackets, carrying a red book with the with the sayings of AOC. So you know, I think we need to uh, wake up. Yeah, so I, you, uh, you, still, you still look like Warhol, by the way. Fine. I mean, Andy Warhol is a good uh, guy. He's a very exciting guy. What What I think is fascinating is that, um, you know, he comes out of here wearing a nice red jacket. He was ready for the whole question of when did you meet? Because he looks like a big heart, a big heart on Valentine's Day before you met. Look at this. Full well, of love. Full, well, when actually love. when he came out in this outfit, him speaking about the little red book, I said, you look like somebody from the the Chinese Communist Party coming out and a big red flag. Yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting to see what's happening in the U.S. So, the, you know, Stacey's uh, been talking about this, the Thucydides trap. So the U.S. is losing its empire to China right now. And yep. to, to try to grab, uh, to try to stop that from happening, the U.S. is resorting to what all empires resort to when they lose their empire. And that is to, instead of unleashing their entrepreneurs to do battle with the rising power, they're trying to curtail the entrepreneurs and they are trying to yep. um, marshal the forces of denial. So they're in, the U.S. is in denial right now uh, in terms of how they're losing status in the world. And the denial is fed by money printing, universal basic income, uh, monetary, mm -hmm. modern monetary theory, uh, various relief, COVID relief, money printing. That just feeds the denial. It's so... The U.S. is, you could say, is, uh, you know, oh. an, an alcoholic that is in denial, right? An alcoholic. And the federal government is just, is, you know, giving them the booze and saying, just keep drinking, keep drinking. Don't worry about it. Everything's under control. And we know how this ends. Uh, it's been happened before in history, and it looks like it's happening now. Uh, unless Bitcoin, the only way the U.S. can 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 get it out of this nosedive into oblivion is if they like what's happening in Miami. So Miami could lead America out of the abyss. You know, they're now going to subsidize Bitcoin mining in, in Miami, in Florida. Okay. Wyoming, of course, has gone Bitcoin centric. But, uh, you know, the mayor of Miami is saying we're going to subsidize Bitcoin mining. So And all of the Bitcoiners are flocking to Miami. So, so Miami and greater Florida area might be able to pull America out of this nosedive if, if, if they act quickly and, and forcefully enough. 
Wonderful. And uh, and you will be speaking, Max. And Stacy, I believe you will also be speaking at uh, Miami. We can't. Yeah. We can't. We can't wait to go there and finally meet all our uh, Bitcoin Art. friends. And um, look Already forward there. to hear both of you speak. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it too because. You know, haven't we've been in Bitcoin since 2011, but it's really in the past year or two that they're just the best people in Bitcoin now. It's so many cool thinkers, philosophers, poets, creators, content creators, yep. you know, the meme makers, like so many, like the past year or two, post 2017, post the crash of 2017, and then from mid 2018 end of 2018 that you really saw the emergence of this like that renaissance 2.0 sort of concept came together like you the 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 people that survived the shit coinery that understood the shit coinery that got to the other side and i just think we have the the best space now and better than anything i've i've personally experienced throughout all these years is like the ideas keep on feeding off each other. I mean, don't you watch other or listen to other podcasts and like you go like, whoa, that's yeah. like really interesting. And then it inspires you down another part of the rabbit hole of, of ideas to think about. So just the fact that there's so many great uh, content creators in this space now, it's yeah. just, um, and, and the pandemic, I think it's just like for, you know, I, I guess because of the explosion of from uh, four thousand, five thousand dollars up to sixty thousand dollars, has really uh, brought forward so many star meme makers and artists and and thinkers that I, I'm so looking forward to meeting everybody in person. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. <laughs> I, 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 this, I just want to say. Yeah, Matt, Max. Yeah, after you took the hat off, you look totally like Bernie Eggleston, the former owner of uh, Formula One. I don't know if Formula you can tell. One, yeah. Um, <laughs> we we had a we had a we had a relevant question from the chat earlier that uh, I really want to ask uh, Max, and that is, do you also own red leather shoes? Because I think they would be hot for Miami. No. That would he be does. Lit. He does. He's going to go get them. He was. You were wearing them earlier today. He has red leather shoes, and you know when you talk about Formula One. The interesting thing about um, how Bitcoin was distributed around the world is that our Kaiser Report show broadcasts in hotels around the world. It broadcasts everywhere around the world on cable and satellite, but it has a special deal with hotels. So it goes into hotels around the world. Oh. Those are his red leather shoes. He was what? wearing them earlier yeah. today. Yeah, I was, yeah. Um, and he hasn't worn them since last summer, so I was excited to see them. So it, yeah, maybe yeah, somebody so was sure. watching us. Maybe somebody was like following us around and so knew knew the answer to this question. <laughs> How's this? It's oh, awesome. Yeah. Max is going more and more Halston. <laughs> I'm, Listen, I'm Halston. I'm, I'm going <laughs> to take. This... I'm going to. I'm going to take this as a screen grab, I'm, and okay. then I get this. Then I get to sell it. Oh yeah, as an <laughs> NFT. NFT. As, as an NFT. Then yeah, I get to no, sell it. But this is my favorite, it's my favorite version of uh, Bernie Eccleston, I got to say. Yeah. So our, our show has basically, while we were covering Bitcoin since 2011, it would go out to the plebs, as you say, or plebs, as I say, around plebs. the world. But also to um, those who are often in hotels. So a lot of rock stars, a lot of Formula One guys, like we have this like, huge following in, fo in Formula One. Like these are people who are in hotels, and of course you're going to tune into CNN International or BBC World, and they have the same thing playing every 15 minutes on a loop, right? And it's really boring and tedious. And then you click on to Max Kaiser <laughs> shouting, and they're like, yeah. "What?" The like the number of searches that we used to get when in the olden days you used to be able to see what people were searching and how they got to your website and stuff like that, and the number of people searching from like the Ritz or the, or the, you know, Four Seasons or the Hyatt. And it would be, who is Max Kaiser? <laughs> what the fuck am I watching? Am I stoned? Did they put something in my water? <laughs> but that's how people, well, they, that, that distribution of understanding and knowledge and, and, and uh, information about Bitcoin was pretty widespread from very early because of that. It wasn't just concentrated in one single market because like one single podcaster who's huge in, in Los Angeles, 
you know, uh, <laughs> was, was talking about it or, or you know, like, yeah. like more localized thing. Our show was dubbed yeah. into Spanish. It was, it was broadcasting all across Latin America. So it was uh, broadcasting in the Middle East. It was broadcasting across Africa and Asia. So it went all over the world and a wide, wide, wide variety of people heard about it very early. Mm -hmm. And I think that is important to the, the kind of ecosystem and, and, and environment we have, the, the sort of people populating the space. There was a widespread of, of Bitcoin knowledge very early on. It's, um, it's amazing to me because I remember, and this one's for the fans in the chat, Yes, uh, 2019 was great, 2018, okay. But 2017 is when I started. <laughs> so when you start at the top, <laughs> it's a rough ride. But listen, these people have been here the whole time. Follow it. Listen to them. Because I guarantee uh, you will be in five years, you will be up, I don't know, 10x. Because I know Anders likes the moon juice. 10x in five years, baby. What do you yeah, think? Yeah, so let. Yeah, let's get your you guys. Uh, Max, you spoke earlier about Bitcoin is going to the um, to the hundreds of thousands. What do you what do you what does Max and Stacy expect for this year, 2021? Uh, how far do you think this bull run will go? And what's going to happen after that? Are we seeing um, super cycle or Max? Go ahead. Well, I. Uh... Went on record in January with my 2021 call for Bitcoin of 220,000 per coin in 2021. So that's my 2021 call, and um, you know we'll see how that goes. So I don't I don't think I need to give any further out predictions than that. I mean that the I, I predicted 28,000 at the end of 2020. Mm. And that's, I think it closed at 28,500 or 28,600. So, and I had made that call two years previous. So I had the most accurate forecast of anybody in the world 24 months before the end of that, of, of last year. So my 2021 call is 220,000 per nice. coin. And that's my call. And uh, then, and then when we, we'll see how that goes. I think that's uh that's reasonable, 220 this year. What about you, Stacey? Um, well, I predict that I will listen to Max more often. You know, we have this series called To the Moon, and it's the first 10 years. There's 10 episodes, and each year, each episode covers one year of Bitcoin. And I'll, uh, it's basically using a lot of Kaiser Report content to show what was happening in that particular year. And when I went through it, I edited it all together. When I went through it, what I realized is like um, back in 2011, 12, and 13, like Max was saying stuff that sounds exactly like what Michael Saylor says today. Like he was saying that 10 years ago and understood in such a profound way that I, I missed. Like it went, you know, I was just, I just heard, you know, I saw that he was speaking on the other side of the set for me and I might not necessarily understood what Max was saying. But then when I now, like in 2019, when I went back and looked through all this content from way long ago, and I was like, oh, my God, Max said this in 2012. Like, how the hell did he know it was going to a trillion dollars? Like, how did he know that the market cap would go there? Like, it seemed insane. Um, I, so yeah. I, my my prediction is I'll listen to him more often now. I'll watch the Kaiser report back more closely from now on. <laughs> Bernie Eggleston knows. Everybody knows that. Bernie Eggleston knows. Um, but um, yeah, I think the reason that Max got it so fast, in my opinion, back then in, two, in 2011, is because he was skeptical of central banking. And uh, w when you understand that everything we see is just a scam of diluting uh, currency, paper money, fake nothing, no assets, just diluting and stealing the value of people's savings, it just clicks, I think, faster when you hear about Bitcoin. Uh, what do you think, Max? Uh, yeah, well, uh, plus I had spent years trying to um, technologically create a virtual currency. So I knew already the challenges and what, what, what one can expect. So when I saw the white paper, it, I, you know, you see what, 
what somebody who figured it out, well, how they figured it out. I mean, the, the, the what yeah. was trying, we, the, as I said before, so that had a lot to do with it. And then my approach is really, let's say most like a Michael Saylor, for example, he's, he's a technologist. He's a, he's a, uh, he's an engineer and he's a, he's, he's a, uh, technological engineer and he's, he's actually a, a rocket scientist. And, uh, and so mm -hmm. his approach is very much from, from that. He's also been a CEO for 20 years and he knows balance sheets, he knows finance and he, and he brings that huge amount of experience and engineering background to it. And for me, it was mostly about finance because I started in wall street. So, and in the 1980s, when I started on Wall Street, it was a time of a huge explosion in financial products that came to market. Before the 1980s, essentially Wall Street, you had two products, stocks and bonds. That was it. Then because of the um, deregulation that wave that came through in the 70s and the beginning of discount brokers like Charles Schwab, Wall Street, to compete with that, started to come up with products, new products, new financial products. To, to sell and they became marketers in a big way. And um, so I was working on Wall Street at that time. And this was also interesting. There was a period of Michael Milken and the leverage buyouts at that time. Um, Ivan Boski was active at that time. Um, and, and this whole uh, wave of activist hedge funds or green mailers um, came, came through wall street, Ron, um, Perlman, is it? Yeah. Ron, Ron Perlman. Perlman. Yeah. And, uh, Ted Turner, of course. Um, and these guys uh, showed up and they challenged the power structure with these leverage buyouts with the help of Milken and Drexel Burnham Lambert. So no, no company was safe from a buyout because of Milken's work, you know, Milken, when he was at Wharton, I guess he had come up with this, his thesis for his uh, doctor, his master's or his master's degree from, from Wharton, his MBA, was this analysis of essentially how B-rated bonds outperformed A-rated bonds. You know, that junk bonds were actually better performers adjusted for risk than a rated bond. So he invented quote unquote, the original junk bond, the original issue B rated bond mm -hmm. that he then would sell to pension accounts. So he had every single pension account in the country plugged into his ex desk in Los Angeles, you know, and then you had these corporate raiders come around and they say, okay, we want to take over. For example, one of the greatest deals at that time was the RCA was uh, taken over. Um, and this was an unbelievable deal. You know, at that time it was risk arbitrage as they called it. So the RCA was being taken over at a 20% premium on the stock and they paid two dividends between the close date and the date. So you were, you were making like 50, 60% annual rates of return on a deal that was 98% certain to go through the general electric, but RCA. And then of course, so, so then radio music, radio city music hall became part of uh, that, that complex became part of uh, General Electric and General Electric ended up buying NBC and, they, and MSNBC and all that other stuff. But so that was like a really interesting period of uh, financial innovation, you know, and also uh, the attitude of Wall Street was that any laws that were broken, they could easily lobby Washington to change the law or to write a new law. So there was no real, there was, they, they, their idea was like, we're innovating, we're, we're doing this and you can't stop us. So it, you know, it instilled in me a real attitude of fuck youism. So like when Bitcoin comes around, I'm like, you know what, I, I, for everyone who says there, that there's going to be regulation or there's going to be pushback, you know, my wall street days, I know from experience that if the money's good, there's no regulation. And we see that right. happening now because the, 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 the rich, very, yeah. very wealthy, powerful people are into Bitcoin now. Yeah. So that tells me what I suspected to be would be the case, that um, yeah. there will be no law against Bitcoin because, because it's too profitable. And what laws can be, I mean, the Wall Street lobbyists control Washington. That Joe Biden is a creation of Wall Street lobbyists. He's a creation of the credit card industry, has been for 50 years. 
he's the last guy who's going to push back against Bitcoin. He probably owns Bitcoin, whether he knows it or not. It's in one of his accounts, you know, in a blind trust since he's president. He probably has a big piece of Bitcoin, as do many, many senators, as many Congress people are now lobbying for Bitcoin. This is exactly what happened on Wall Street. The marauders came in in the 80s and uh, yeah. they broke laws left, right and center and they changed the laws because when he, he who has, you know, the Bitcoin makes the laws. And that's what that's the law of the land. So there's not going to be any, there's no government's going to, American government's not going to shut down Bitcoin. Never, no, no way. Not with a trillion dollar market cap going to 10 trillion, 11 trillion dollar market cap. That's not going to happen. Not going to happen. If I have to go to Washington personally and lobby these knuckleheads, I'll do so. You know, I don't want to waste my time. I'd rather have somebody else do it. But if push comes to shove, I'm happy to go to D.C. and sit in front of a congressperson and grab him by the lapel and say, change this law, you fucking servant of mine. I voted. I'm I'm the taxpayer. Fuck you. Change the law right now. And, and they'll he's, do yeah, it. He's going to wear that outfit. And they'll do it because that's what they do. Yes. That's what they do. That's how they do it, man. They're not, they're there to work in our interests. And one way or another, that point will be made. And take one way or another. And take kickbacks. Right. That point will be made. That point's being made now. You don't think the guys who own big positions are not basically given the old, you know, arm around the shoulder. Hey, Bob, let's have a little chat. <laughs> you know, they're all getting educated now. So within six months, I mean, that's the greatest hope is that the U.S., like what's happening in, in Miami, they start subsidizing Bitcoin mining. It becomes the new space race. All right, we're going to win the global hash war. America number one. Oh. That's that's what's going to happen in the next six months. There's <laughs> going to be no regulatory re, uh, mm. uh, pushback whatsoever because uh, rich people like to like like staying rich, and um, we know how to stay rich, and uh, we'll do what we always do. And end of story. Oh. Let me jump in on this one real quick, Andrew, because I find this fascinating. I love this. Because Max has brought this up before, the global hash war, which it is coming. And now, you know, we love our Greg Foss. We love our um, our Adam, Denver Bitcoin. I love what they're doing because 67%, I think, of all energy is wasted. Now we can turn it into, uh, I don't know, proper Bitcoin mining. So what do you guys think of the the hash rate war coming up? I think America needs to act quickly because you've got um, Iran has already got, I think, two or three percent of the hash rate. And you've got um, some other countries are already actively um, hoarding and mining Bitcoin because it's, the, 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 the stronger the U.S. imposes sanctions and they just impose another round of sanctions. Yep. Yep. The U.S. Um, with the EU, supposedly, although Germany is a big fat question mark and the U.K., they're saying, oh, we're going to apply another round of sanctions. And so what 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 these countries are hearing is that um, I guess we need to buy more Bitcoin. They're not stupid. They're buying Bitcoin because they know it's the Achilles heel of the U.S. dollar. U.S. dollar system, if it doesn't have confidence by everybody, then it'll have confidence from nobody. It's a, it's a, it's a zero-sum game yes. with the U.S. dollar. If, if even one of the folks that are involved in us dollar hegemony decides to give the us the big fuck you then the whole souffle collapses uh and it doesn't work anymore you have a, a hyperinflationary that to me the bitcoin's already showing that the us dollar is in a hyperinflationary collapse against bitcoin right now that's what that's what that's any intelligent yeah. person would figure that out right now but you know if if you're if you haven't figured that out and you actually want to see china for example dump dollars in a, in as part of the geopolitical conflict that's heating up. If you want to wait for that and see your prices at your grocery store and the gas station triple and then figure out what to do, have, have, have luck. Good luck. I think the U S is probably already aware of all of this. Not only are, did the U S invent all most of this cryptography, by the way, but they also, um, Jerome Powell just said this past week that Bitcoin is similar to gold, yeah. not the dollar. <laughs> and this one. the yeah. U.S. central bank owns the most gold in the world, and they make sure they always own the most gold in the world. They also hold other countries' gold, and Jim Rickards 
has said, you know, the U.S. will seize that gold <laughs> should they ever need it. That's why we hold it all for other nations. Um, ah. So I think they understand that they need to have gold uh, to have Bitcoin because they yeah. they already own all the gold. Now they're saying our own central bank, the, the head of the central bank is saying that Bitcoin is gold 2.0. So, of course, the U.S. is going to want to have Bitcoin to um, count, you know, to have the most gold 2.0. So I think I think that's going to happen because I think we understand it. I think, um, you know, all those. Back in uh, 2014, 2015, 2016, you saw a lot of banks like JP Morgan, Goldman Sachs, like they created those R3 and stuff like that. And they started looking at blockchain. They were hoping to be able to do blockchain, not Bitcoin. And I, I, they all gave that up, right? And the reason why they gave it up is because they, they researched it and studied it and looked at it. And they were like, reported back to the government, holy shit. There is no way out of this, okay? Um, we just have to adopt Bitcoin because we're fucked. Mm. So, and I'm sorry, somebody in the comments has said that this is a, a, a show for children and that Anders no. can't no. swear no, words. Fuck that. fuck that. No, it's not. No, no, no. <laughs> fuck uh, that. Look, Stacey, the, the, what I say is, uh, like, if people say they don't like us swearing, they don't like us saying shit coin, I say, look, we are fighting a regime that is killing millions of peoples in fiat uh, finance regime. wars, and all we are doing is swearing. We ain't killing anyone. This is a peaceful revolution. All we do is we, we call out scams for what they are. We call shit coins for shit coins, and it's because we want the better for humanity. And uh, and and uh, it's nothing compared to the the fiat financed uh, wars that are just uh, uh, killing killing the it's prosperity started. of humanity. Stacy, what do you think the world will be like uh, once we have uh, Bitcoin as the global money standard? And I just want to throw in that the most productivity growth that U.S. has ever seen was from 1873 to 1892. That was a 20 year period. Where, where gold was the sound money of U.S. Uh, with an inflation rate below 2%. Uh, Bitcoin will have eventually an inflation rate of 0%, right? It'll actually be minus because people will lose some Bitcoin. How do you see um, the world? Um, uh, uh, how will the world be in a, a complete sound money system with Bitcoin? I think um, Bitcoin is so many things to so many people. So I think those who need a store of value, it will do amazing things for them. And it does alter your perception and how you interact with the world. Like I, for example, I, ne I spend so little money now. I used to spend a lot of money. I used to buy lots of clothes, do my hair. Now I do my own hair. And granted, I have to use curling irons now in order to hide the fact that it's all like, messed up and there's a whole bunch of different layers of equal uh, unequal length because i cut it myself but i'm like fuck it i'm not going to spend four hundred dollars or five hundred dollars that a haircut costs for a lady you know and i'm going to buy bitcoin instead but then you look at uh say nigeria in terms of the censorship resistant uh, medium of exchange or unit of account and how that has allowed a very entrepreneurial uh, people to access the global economy. So here you have all of this resource rich Africa and you see the way the fiat system works as a very benign imperial power. They're not killing anybody. They're not you know, squashing them down and putting them in, into camps or anything like that. They're just saying, hey, we're a global meritocracy. If you can build your own factories and, and, and do, you know, provide the, <clears throat> the layer of value to your raw ingredients, do it, compete with us. But they don't have access to the capital. They don't have access to the global financial system because it's a US dollar system. And there might be terrorists there. There might be a bad guy there. So they cut off the entire freaking continent. And lo and behold, they're cut off from capital and they have to sell for cheap their resources to US or European uh, corporations, multinationals who then get to extract all the value from them. So when you have Bitcoin and with this year of pandemic, what especially happened for Nigeria is there was a shortage of US dollars there that, 
you know, there's a huge import business there for all sorts of enterprises, but a big one for used cars. So they import a lot of cars, used cars from Japan and China. But the U.S. doesn't it gives them a hard time accessing that settlements layer that they control, the SWIFT system and all the other settlement layers of, of the U.S. financial system around the world. And um, their own government uh, needed hard currency and cut them off from U.S. dollar supply. So they turned to Bitcoin and business flourished. They were actually making more profit because there was less money and less time spent on having to deal with the U.S settlements layer. So the em empires always do that, right? That's how they all fall because they make a lot of money on the senior edge. They get to bully everybody. They don't need to innovate. They could just say, fuck you, use our payment system. And if you're not, we're going to mm. freaking drone you. And that's what happens. Mm. But at a certain point, like something like this comes along and there is an explosion in, in creativity, innovation, uh, trade stuff happened. Free trade. That's what free trade is. And Nigerians were allowed to access the global financial grid equally with any American, any yeah. European. And they were able to buy those cars, import those used cars and start selling them. And I think that's, you know, that's the beauty of the, of, of Bitcoin. The, the fact that that could do that and you know, uh, there have been some people on the news recently saying it's never used as a medium of exchange. Nobody uses it. It's too expensive. It's like, dudes, have you been to Nigeria and being able to see no. like how a, an importer there, like a, a small import export business, like what are the costs to them to use a U.S. dollar? It's if it's even possible. It's huge cost, but it's often it's usually not possible for them to use it. It's always possible, however, for them to access Bitcoin because Bitcoin doesn't censor. Absolutely. Um, so, Max, I, I would say if Stacy does her own hair, you need to uh, create a, uh, a salon <laughs> chain uh, with Stacy, and you, you've got a money machine right there. Um, have you thought about that? Oh, hell yeah. You know, we also do butt waxing and crack waxing. <laughs> <laughs> All waxing for men. That's a huge industry there. Back sack and crack waxing. <laughs> hey, you know what? I encourage it. Um, you know, there was a period of time where I was kind of like resting on my laurels and my OG status and like happy to just like uh, collect my Bitcoin. But now like with all of this new wave of people and ideas and enthusiasm and people like, um, you know, Michael Saylor saying he doesn't have enough Bitcoin. Then I'm like, damn, I need more fiat. Give me more fiat. I, I need more Bitcoin. It's like, it's, it's so uh, exciting again. I really feel like I need to find any way to get fiat. Give me some fiat. And, you know, Max keeps throwing this like fake fiat toy cash at me. And uh, I've tried and nobody will accept that. Yeah, Bitcoin. bummer. It's always uh, earning, burning, churn of funk is Bitcoin. <laughs> it's a volcano that never stops. It's erupting always. <laughs> you know, it's beautiful, but you can never get burned. You can only be enlightened. Uh, absolutely. Uh, Max, so what, what is your answer to like, so we are fighting this uh, evil central bankers that have now ruled the world for 108 years. Uh, when we finally win, which is, it's inevitable like because they can't stop Bitcoin because it's decentralized. So how do you see the world? What will the world be like when Bitcoin becomes global monetary standard? Will we see? Um, yeah. What, 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 what do you see happening? Well, it's going to be a lot more peaceful and a lot less violent because Bitcoin monetizes peace and love and it demonetizes war and hate. Right. All war and hatred is fed by fiat money. The war is certainly fed by fiat money, endless wars, perpetual wars. If you can print to go to war with some other country, you're not going to stop printing and you're not going to stop your war. Look at the U.S. is in several wars for decades now because they just print lots of money. So you're going to have a lot more peaceful world, a lot more loving world. And because you can't just print recklessly forever, the way to make profits or the way to become um let's say um wealthy would be through innovation so innovation is is the way you uh can 
aggregate wealth in that kind of situation. And um, so we're going to have a lot more innovation in that respect. There's going to be a lot more trade and peaceful trade because the only way, because Bitcoin's unconfiscatable, the only way you could get somebody's Bitcoin is by offering something that they want in exchange for some Bitcoin. And you'd have to do that in a way that is peaceful and in a way that it is going to appeal to that person and you can do a deal and you can maybe get some Bitcoin that way. So if I'm an artist, it should, it should appeal to artists and original thinkers. You know, if you can come up with, with original art and things like that, and you can get Bitcoin for it, you know, a lot more people are going to figure out that they should allow their inner artistic expression to find a voice and to, and to let that out. And then that elevates the culture, elevates the consciousness. And uh, it demonetizes peace, it demonetizes hatred, it demonetizes divisiveness. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we enter into, with the perfect money, you have perfect price discovery, and you have the, you have the chance of a perfect union with the global unconscious. And so everyone is essentially fused. Like um, the forest, for example, mm -hmm. is interesting because you, you see a lot of uh, individual trees, but on the, on the roots, underneath the soil, they're all interconnected. And and uh, Brad and Brandon Quidham did a great essay about this in terms of the the fungi and and the root systems and the nature and how that's all essentially connected to one communications network, if you will. That's all vibrating. Everything is vibrating. Rocks are vibrating. The planet's vibrating. Trees are vibrating. Animals are vibrating. They're, everything is vibrating. Nothing is not vibrating. There's nothing that's truly dead. Um, it sounds. Even, it even sounds very dead, Tesla. Even a dead corpse is still, because it's part of the earth, it's vibrating yeah. to some degree. So the death doesn't, there's no such thing as death. So um, Bitcoin with the Satoshi as the unit of account, one, you know, one one hundred millionth of a Bitcoin, you have a way to monetize thoughts and even monetize your own thoughts. So, you know, your brain is divided into the left and right hemisphere. You know, I, I, I believe at some point you're going to be thinking between your own hemispheric brain and in thinking in terms of satoshis so your right brain will be actively trading with your left brain to gain more satoshis and vice versa so you'll be mining bitcoin with your mind essentially um and you're living within that global unconscious and everybody else is still part of the same one and so time will cease to exist we enter in what's called the cosmic now so we have no sense of of the past or the future. We're all vibrating together. And and so that's what happens when you have perfect money and perfect price discovery. There's there's no la there's no legacy. There's no lag time. There's no shadows. All shadows disappear. We're all at high noon. Perfect money, perfect price discovery, perfection is 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 what we've always been striving for since humans first walked the earth. They've been curious. And, the, and it's gotten into a lot of troubles. Our curiosity has, has led to atrocity and, and huge errors mm -hmm. along the way. And, but we've never stopped being curious. And now with Bitcoin, we have the final base camp before we climb the summit of Mount Bitcoin and stand on top of our own collective unconscious and that can declare victory finally. We will see the face of God in the at the end of the day. Bitcoin is that last step before we see the face of God, which is what we've been striving for for two hundred thousand years. The, the curiosity is has been driving us to this moment. And our generation, you know, I'm sixty years old, so I'm actually at the very. I'm. It's a race against time because. But for the millennials, they will see the face of God for sure. They're the, the millennials that are alive today. We'll, we'll meet God, um, which will be great. You know, it'll be like, finally, after 200,000 years, we understand what, what's going on. Everyone who came before hasn't really understood, but they're not really dead either anyway, and nothing ever dies. Well, I mean, if you think about all the religions of the world and stuff, everybody's been trying to teach you to how, that, that the, the path to seeing that God, whatever it is, you know, is, is, is overcoming narcissism to become humble to become uh to be able to to submit to this higher power that is the universe and bitcoin allows that right because 
Like think of the world right now, it's structured around the US dollar as the global settlements layer, English language. Uh, it, America is the indispensable nation where uh, there's American exceptionalism. Nobody's mm -hmm. exceptional in Bitcoin. Doesn't matter, like um, Michael Saylor, even though he has like nearly 100,000 Bitcoin, he's not exceptional. He can't, be, he can't do anything to divert the outcome of Bitcoin more than anybody with 100, you know, 100,000 Satoshis. Yeah. They're, they're equal in that system. So that forces mm -hmm. you to be humble because um, look at this guy, Chamath, that is like try to like smash a uh, surfer gym and be like, dude, you're poor. I'm a billionaire. And uh, who, who got yeah. owned? Well, it was uh, Chamath, right? Like he got owned. And because it Bitcoin forces and the Bitcoin community forces you to be humble, it's like, no, you know, F you get off this, uh, you know, get out of here. We don't want to hear you. You, 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 yeah. you don't control us. The plebs, the plebs control you. So, um, plebs. No, F, F you. Right. So the humility is actually monetized and it's a strength. Yeah. Whereas in our it current is. system, humility is considered to be a weakness, but it's flipped. Mm. Everything that was on the bottom is going to be on the top. Everything on the top is going to be on the bottom. There's a total flip. Mm. I think flipped. I've heard this before. Yeah. I think it was flip. called the, ser the Sermon on the Mount. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, all, all every, every text that has come before has hinted at this, the revelation has, has hinted at the final revelation. And usually all art and all science hints at the final revelation. I was just in, in quantum physicists are, I've just are they're on the verge of discovering yet another subatomic particle that'll bring yeah. us yet closer to this face of God. Every artist has been trying to reveal the face of God. When you see art that moves you emotionally, yeah. it's yeah. removing your fear and replacing it with love. That's that's the emotion, that's the feeling you have because you're seeing it's getting closer. The the demonetization of fear is is remarkable because that's been with us for 200,000 years. And most mm. people are motivated and driven by their fears. Fear of being left out, fear of looking less than, fear of not having enough, fear of hunger, fear of uh, rejection. And all those fears go away with uh, perfect money, perfect price discovery. So that that is something else we're going to be looking forward to. And when you remove fear from the equation, you you have achieved you, you one one with with that global unconscious vibration. Look, Mon. look at as well what uh, fiat allows is think of um, a lot of the problems in the world right now is as I was mentioning with Africa is because of fiat the U.S. And, and the U.S. dollar as a global uh, settlement layer, that we're able to prevent Africans themselves from creating value out of their own resources. But we get to feel amazingly generous and so amazing. Like we are divine people because for every hundred dollars of value we steal, we give them 50 cents back in charity do what you want with this and use our NGOs, however, which we then take another of that 50 cents we give you back. We'll take, uh, yeah. you know, about 40 cents and we'll give you 10 cents. But <laughs> I am such a good person. And wow, I am just like obviously destined for heaven, fiat heaven. Mm -hmm. Like, so like that's just gross. And you, and most people, mm -hmm. especially in the Bitcoin yeah. world can see that you tune into cable news, listen to Rachel Maddow show. And you're like, you guys are gross. Fuck. You do understand what like the, yes. the, the path of why, why those people are poor. Yeah, yeah. They don't need so charity. Good. They have all the entrepreneurialism, all of the innovation, all of the resources that they need, but you just freaking steal them through your system. Yeah. You need to get the fuck out. That's yeah. what they need. <laughs> let, let them have Bitcoin and they will, <laughs> Yeah. They will outcompete you within five years. Yeah, totally, totally. That's what's happening in Africa right now. Africa could be really leading the whole Bitcoin charge without a doubt within the next two or three years, because um, because they, they don't have fiat stupidness. They, they don't have they, the fiat stupidness. They don't have the banking infrastructure to to keep them down, uh, and they're they're and they they're ready to go. So I think Africa is really in, in Nigeria. They, uh, our friend who who runs Paxful, Ray Youssef. Ray Youssef. We just did an interview with Ray. And yeah. you can just listen to it. You can see it in his eyes. You see it in his, his the way he carries himself. He he knows he's he's on the the cutting edge of something remarkable. And what he and what he sees in Africa is incredible. And that this is where the Bitcoin revolution is really happening. 
uh, more than any other place. In the U.S., not so much because we are the biggest losers in the Bitcoin standard would be the U.S. dollar, right? So people are in denial, and that's the, understandable. The elite, the elite in the U.S. dollar system. I think, um, you know, well, Anders, you're from Europe, and I think, you know, Max and I lived there for close to, um, you know, 15, 20 years. So what you see is they used to have empires, they used to have the reserve currencies, and yet when you read about their history, the ordinary person didn't live so well. Now the ordinary person in Europe lives freaking well compared to the ordinary American. So the reserve currency status and imperial power benefits the top 0.1% very, very much. It, and it harms the rest of the population, the rest of the domestic population. And you see that if you live overseas, if you travel, if you see what Europeans post empire live like, they live a lot better than they did the ordinary person compared to when they had an empire. Stacy, do you think that uh, the, the, the bottom of society, so to speak, of, of US is, is worse off because US has the ability to print uh, money faster than the rest of the world because of the world reserve currency? You're saying, you're saying yes, I can see. Uh, Max, what about you? Well, as I mentioned earlier, it all comes down to interest rates. So if you're not part, if, if there is a class of people in the U.S. that can borrow at 0% and they can buy income producing assets for that and they can use that as collateral to borrow more at 0%. And then everyone else has to borrow 18% or if you're on a payday loan, it's going to be 5,000%. So um, if you want to achieve equality in the U.S., the first thing you would do is raise interest rate on the short term rates to 5%. This is what the, if that's what you do. And you would immediately move, uh, you know, $20 trillion out of the pockets of the, those who are scalping for a living, the rentiers, and it would be reinvested in the economy on day one. That's how you do it. That's how, that, that, that's, that's where the, the imbalance in the U S is, is, is you can see it in one chart the yield curve it goes from zero 18 two thousand percent that's 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 the problem and as long as and that's why it's important for the policymakers to constantly say that there's no inflation because that's how they justify zero percent interest rates they don't they don't mention the fact that inflation is actually 10 to 12 percent right now they don't want to mention that fact because they would you couldn't then justify 0% interest rates. If they were to, were honestly reporting on inflation that it's 10 to 12%, then yes, inflation the interest rate the nom the 10 year bond would be not at 170, it would be at 570, which is that would mean that 80 to 90% of the rentier class would mm -hmm. get destroyed. And that money would move into the general economy, and you would have a you would have a huge economic boom, uh, a day one. But that's not possible while the U.S. is a reserve currency, the reserve currency, the settlements layer. Mm -hmm. Because think about how it operates. So, in order for China and Russia to settle their trade in dollars, in order for Africa to settle their trade with Japan in dollars. They, in order for Europe to settle their trade with Brazil in dollars, what has to happen? The U.S. has to export, uh, import more than they export. They need to send dollars overseas. So with, with the U.S. dollar as the world's reserve currency, it does give the American treasury and it does give the American elite immense power to sanction their enemies. But, it also destroys the domestic uh, worker and saver because there's no, you, you, you have to have trade imbalances in order to get the dollars overseas. There's no other way yeah. unless you just send them free money for nothing. But you have to pretend like there's this whole system has some uh, legitimacy. So you have to send all this money, send all those dollars to China in order to get dollars out of the U.S. Oh. to those countries. Because if you don't have dollars outside of the U.S., you can't have the reserve currency. So, 
you know, when it was gold, everybody just go bought gold and there's gold from all over the world. And, you know, it, it, that's one thing. But here with the U.S. dollar, you can only get it from the U.S. Treasury. So therefore, how to get those dollars overseas? Well, you have to abandon manufacturing in the United States and send it overseas. So th these two go hand in hand. <laughs> so you can't you can't fix it without getting rid of the U.S. dollar as reserve currency. And a lot of people will be tuning into MSNBC, will be tuning into CNN or Fox. And Fox and those guys, they're all elite, and they'll tell the American population the opposite. Like, oh, China's harming the US dollar. We need the US dollar as an exorbitant privilege. It's only an exorbitant privilege for the top 0.1%, perhaps a 0.1%, you know, 0.01%. So it's, it's, it doesn't benefit the ordinary person. And in fact, it harms the ordinary American. I agree. Poppy, um, you've, you've been on the quiet the last uh, 15, 20 minutes. Do you have any uh, comments or questions? Or should I browse no. right over? No, I think, it, listen, Stacey's absolutely right. Um, <laughs> you know, I go back to the days of Ron Paul, of that giant sucking sound that you hear. All the jobs leave in America. That's been going on for 30 years now, man. The jobs have left. And there has been no hope, no hope left at all until Bitcoin. Bitcoin is the only hope for the working man, in my opinion. That's all. I think so, too. Who was that um, presidential candidate against uh, uh, Bush and Clinton? Yeah, Ron, yeah uh, Ron Paul. No, 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 not Ron Paul. Uh, before him. Oh, no, no, before Ron Paul. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, also from Texas. What's the guy's name? Yes. Yes. He, he oh, cost the, George W H W Bush the presidency to Clinton, that first administration. He ran all those. Basically, he used uh, U.S. Uh, media laws, which was allowed him to take out yeah. one-hour ads ac uh, across the U.S. Ross Perot. We have it. Uh, Ross from Perot. East yes. Ross, Ross Perot. Perot. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Ron Paul. Ross Perot. R P. I call him R P. Yeah. But Ross he Perot. was. At but he was he, absolutely he said that correct. Giant sucking sound. He said he was the one that came up with that giant sucking sound. And, yes. Um, yes. Also, um, Trump's trade representative, Lighthizer, he was also yeah. very, very early. He said it in, in the late 90s when, when Clinton was pushing for China to c get into the WTO. He said, um, he said, this is, they're going to eat our lunch. They're, they are, yeah. he, sa he said, like 98% of US manufacturing jobs will go to China. Joe Biden, at the same time, who was in the Senate, said, China's going to eat our lunch. Come on, man. Come on. Like, who? Yeah. that's ridiculous. So um, mm -hmm. Biden was wrong. But, um, <laughs> you know, <laughs> I, I could go off on that. But um, no, you're absolutely right. Joe, Bi oh, Joe Biden. I don't even know where he is right now. I have no idea where he is on any side of the ledger. <laughs> the guy is out there. Well, I mean, Max and I were around, you know, I'm a Generation X, he's a boomer. Uh, I remember when he passed the 1994 Crime Act, like that incarcerated millions of black Americans. Yeah. But he was somehow like in this election, like the answer to racism. And you're like, but like my memories of 94 are when he did that. He also like, it was like, I'm going to get rid of student debt. And you're like, but the explosion of student debt happened because of Joe Biden's 2005 bankruptcy bill. And like, yeah. like it's just like, it's, it, those are kind of like end of empire disintegration of any sort of rationality or um, it's just like, it goes into bonkersville, right? Like people are like, even though the guy's entire history of his entire 50 years of legislative history is the exact opposite. What he's done for 50 years of his life in power was the exact opposite of what you say he's going to do as president. You're like, wow, this is like crazy. Like there are other guys. If you want an old white dude who's been around in power for 50 years, there's other ones that didn't actually write the crime bill, that didn't write the bankruptcy act, that didn't campaign against uh, uh, desegregation. Like he, the guy like actually campaigned to prevent busing of black kids into white schools. So it's just like, you know, there are other people 
out there that have also been in power for a few decades and are also senile. Like you could have like chosen other ones that are still in power because <laughs> that's the system, way our system works. Yeah. Max, Max, I have a question for you. So, <laughs> uh, you know, I'm just a guest in your great country and I noticed the last 50 years there are only two presidents that during their first term did not ask Congress for more military funding. Uh, those were Jimmy Carter, a Democrat, and Donald Trump, a Republican. Those two oh. presidents are the oh. only ones that did go. not get elected for a second term, that did not ask the Congress to spend more money uh, on ammunition and bombs. Uh, is that a coincidence or is, is deep state military complex at play in the American presidential elections? Right. Well, it, as we were saying before, it's a, a function of fiat money. So fiat money means you can um, bomb people without uh, recourse. It, it, it incentivizes and it monetizes hatred and war and sadism. So Jimmy Carter and Trump were not sadists. And that's a problem for the for the industrial and the defense contractors. They know they they need a sadist in office or someone who's got dementia so that they can just bomb people, commit genocide with no accountability, because that's what sadists do. Oh. And the US policy is essentially sadism. And it became that way through fiat money. As I said before, not necessarily jokingly, that fiat money is the devil's currency. It sounds humorous. However, it, there's a point there. It, it fuels sadism. And that's what the U.S. foreign policy is. And that's what all those dead people will tell you in all those countries where they've been murdered. And it's enabled by fiat money. So the two presidents you mentioned were... Hmm. One, Jimmy Carter was openly pacifistic and Trump was openly anti-war. So there you have it. Yeah, and Donald Trump, and I'm not trying to be political here, but he was, he was nominated for a Nobel Peace Prize, wasn't he? Like the first U.S. president ever, I think. No, 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 Obama won. Obama won the oh. Peace Prize because he made sure to ask for extra military funding during every single his, term. No, his, his drone strikes, his drone strikes were so precise that they said he didn't kill anyone outside of the intended target. Well, I mean, like that, like I said, the structure of the U S dollar global financial system and the settlements layer unit of account means that you have to abandon most of America. So I think that's part of the reason why we have so many wars is like Rachel Maddow, if you look at her, she emotes very much with her face. She needed to save the women and children of Benghazi. If you are against the war against Libya, you are against the women and children of Benghazi. But 70,000 Americans every year overdose right now on opioids. Does she yeah. have any emotive faces about that? Does she plead with the people of America to fix that? Our mil our health industrial complex, our um, the the fact that all of their jobs have been sent overseas and they have nothing to live for. Like where where are her pleas for that? Why 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 is like you know most of the ads against her show are for Raytheon or Lockheed Martin? I'm not sure who in her audience actually buys their actual products, but they certainly buy the wars that uh, those two companies support. Yeah. So mm. like why, why ask yourself why her audience cared so much more about the people of Benghazi allegedly than the people of West Virginia or Ohio or Iowa or, you know, anywhere else in America. Yeah. Why based on America's justification for, bombing foreign countries, they would rightfully be bombing themselves. Yeah. Why doesn't America bomb itself? <laughs> because that, what's happening in America fulfills what America says their bombing campaigns are there to fix. I, I can't disagree. It's, it's happening in Philadelphia. It's happening in Chicago. It's happening in Los Angeles. Where, where, yeah. where are the bombers? Shouldn't we be bombing? That's that's what we that's what we're told. That's what Rachel Maddow we're, says. We're we're justified yeah. in bombing all these countries, but why not bomb Los but, Angeles? 
also speaking of Los Angeles, I mean, definitely go s somewhere like San Francisco. So if you have any like, oh, you know, but I love the American elite are amazing. And there's like, let's give, let's give Facebook and Twitter the rights to censor all these bad, toxic people. Let's like, they, we trust, we trust the Silicon Valley elite. Well, go to San Francisco mm. and see what you see on the streets there. See the humanitarian disaster there yeah. on the streets for all to see. Any, if you could buy a flight from anywhere in the world for 500 bucks, just go there, stay there for two days and tell me what you see. Honestly, go there and tell me what you see and tell me whether or not those people should be in charge of the global world, taking care, taking care of people around the world. Mm. They can't take care of their own people in their own little tiny city of San Francisco. It's not a huge city. If they can't take care of those people, how do you expect them to actually take care of the people of Benghazi or the people of any other country we want to bomb? Like, wh wh where does he, this even, like, how do people even jump to that? Like, yeah, I believe they want to go take care of those people over there in Benghazi. You're like, they can't take care of their own people. Like, how, how do you make that conclusion that they genuinely, genuinely, totally love the people of Benghazi or Afghanistan or Iraq or Yemen or Somalia like, or Syria? Like, how, how, do, how do you even add that up if they can't prove it with their own people? I, I guess the central bankers take care of the 0.1% of their own people in the United States, but not necessarily the plebs or the plebs. Uh, Ma Max, uh, you've been on Wall Street, you've been in the money world. Who actually owns the central bank, the so-called Federal Reserve uh, of the United States? Who owns it? Well, it's, a, it's a private bank and it's owned by I don't know, 10 or 11 families. And they, they, it's a great business, right? They lend money to the treasury essentially at interest. So it's a, it's a great business and uh, it's owned by uh, a dozen or so families. Been been there for a while, and and they read the the the, the dark Bible, the, the satanic Bible, how to um, take out um, value and um, yeah from from people. Um, well, the U.S. you know was successful up until uh, nineteen until nineteen thirteen in keeping the central bank out, right? But then under I guess it was under Wilson they had that midnight meeting after the meeting at Jekyll's Island and they instituted yeah. actually the bank, the federal reserve bank is a branch of the bank of England, right? The bank of England and in London, in the city of London, it's an incorporated location. There's only three places in the world that have their own kind of state outside of all States. That's the city of London, the Vatican and Washington, DC. So those three locations operate on their own legal system. They're not answerable to anybody else. And the city of London is essentially where the globe goes to outsource their financial fraud. Every financial crime wave that we've seen over the past 20 years, most spectacularly, whether it's AIG, the Lehman, 2008 crisis, uh, you know, you name every single financial scam of the last big financial thing of the last 20 years. And it all goes through London because London, the regulatory climate in London is, is the weakest. So it's the place you outsource all, all of your criminality. And it has repercussions because now it turns out that it's also London is where America's outsourced all their illegal spying and all their illegal espionage and all their illegal other illegal activities have all gone through, for example, the Steele dossier, right? That's just an, another example of outsourcing your what you can't do under the Constitution. You do it in London and then you work it back through in, into the U.S. So, so that's why I'm often critical of Great Britain and the city of London because I recognize its role as the concierge of fraud and deceit for the globe. And that it Edward does, Snowden pointed it out yeah, as Edward well Snowden in his documents. Out. Yeah. That all the spying on US, because the NSA is not allowed to spy on Americans, they asked GCHQ to do it. And then GCHQ gives them the information. So, <laughs> same thing in the banking system. It all, all the fraud goes through London. So then they work together. And it's, it's, a, and yeah. you know, I don't, I, I mean, you know, anyway, I can go on for, I won't, but I mean, it's not a good situation. If we had a representative government, when those Edward Snowden documents were released, somebody mm -hmm. should have been at, demanding that, 
you know, and changing the law that the NSA is not allowed to spy on Americans and they're not allowed to pay anybody else or ask anybody else or uh, receive a favor from anybody else yeah. that anybody else spies on Americans. So they shouldn't ever receive any information at all from foreign governments or foreign agencies or foreign mm. corporations or military uh, complex sort of countries. Yeah, like I mean, once you live in, around the world and live in London and live in different countries, and when you watch people in Congress give testimony about how they're not spying or they're not doing this or not doing that, and you actually know what's going on, it's really funny to see the, the open lying and see the senators and the Congress people who are asking the questions are so clueless. And um, they so play the bimbo. They I play the, 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 it's, they play the useful idiot. To, to use a phrase from a yeah. previous uh, era. Yeah, and um, and you're you're right, Stacey. Even though uh, the Edward Snowden and every oh, that whole story came out, nothing changed uh, legally, saying that that kind of behavior had to go away. Like it's just business as usual, right? Um. Yeah. Well, obviously the U S became very hostile to Russia after that. And I think a lot of this Russia gate stuff stems from that. Um, like of course the memory of, of our cable news and the think tank blue check sort of people, the, the, the aristocrats who want to rule over us plebes, they pretend like none of that existed, but it's quite clear that, you know, sanctions and all that sort of stuff started being applied and hostility towards Russia once they gave sanctuary to Edward Snowden. So I think that yeah. has been a huge cost to Russia for um, for giving him sanctuary, giving uh, Edward Snowden sanctuary. I think that has cost them a lot for what they uh, allowed there. Um, and it still plays out to this day in this um, the Russiagate hysteria and uh, the xenophobia essentially. I mean, you know, a, a lot of the Democrats and cable news people were um, condemning Trump, rightfully so, for saying Mexico sends us their rapists. Um, but like what what the the Democrats and much of the cable news say about Russia is just as xenophobic. I mean, it's just as um, racist and, and xenophobic as 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 anything that Trump ever said about Mexicans. Yeah, true. So, so uh, Max and Stacy, you know, we know that your time is 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 scarce, as scarce as Bitcoin. It's um, so we we are very happy to have you here today and uh, sharing all your your thoughts and the poetry, uh, financial poetry from uh, from Max. Um, uh, but uh, anyway, we love to continue, but we know that yeah, yeah, your t time time has to come to an end at some stage. Uh, we have your Twitter. Uh, links down below. Um, you're doing the the rich, uh, the sorry, the orange pill uh, podcast. Um, mm. Is there any other topics you would like to cover now? Any uh, messages you want to say to our uh, many uh, amazing people in the chat and viewers? Or well, I really have to wait, so um, I'm ready to wrap up. And definitely go and subscribe to our YouTube channel, youtubecom slash orange pill. And of course, remember that there are every single time we post a video, there's like five, six, seven, 12, this last yeah. episode, like scammers that pretend they, they take our name, they pretend to be us and they try, they write, they respond to your comments and say, Hey, contact me on WhatsApp. Well, it's not Max telling you that. So uh, be careful out there because as we enter, as we head towards 200,000, you're going to get more and more of those people trying to steal your corn. So make sure you hold on to it. <laughs> don't give it to it. Don't send it to Max. Don't send it to me. Don't send it to these plebes here. Just like keep on, hold your Bitcoin and don't send it to anybody, no matter who, who they are, no matter how famous you think the person is. If you think you're talking to Elon Musk, I guarantee you, you're not talking to Elon Musk. He's not asking for your Bitcoin. So don't freaking send it to him. All right. Now. I second that. Ex excellent. Uh, Poppy, do you have anything final, final question for um, Der Kaiser yeah. and Queen Stacy. <laughs> hey, what can, what can you say at the end of the day? <laughs> These are um, the, the first couple of Bitcoin. I love it. They they always put Bitcoin first before anything else. So thank you for hanging out with us, for one. Um, you have changed so many lives. I don't care about the number of Bitcoin you have. I care about the number of Bitcoin you have inspired people to buy. Well, it's reciprocal. 
you know, we, we feed off the energy of the community as well. So we're just part of the community and uh, we're always learning new stuff. And so, you know, it's always exciting for us, you know, that there's no, there's nothing I can say that would hurt Bitcoin because there is no leader. There's no, yeah. that's it gives yeah. me a lot of freedom. I know that no matter what I say, no matter what I do, it's not going to hurt Bitcoin, you know, because there's no leader to it. It's leaderless. It's on its own vector. And so it's the best community to be a part of because nobody ultimately has any impact on it. It's on its own vector. It's just, it's going on its own path. No, nothing can stop it. Humans could become extinct and Bitcoin would still be going and still be hashing and still mm. and doing what it's going to do. So, you know, either get with Satoshi, get right with Satoshi <laughs> or, or, you know, feel, feel Satoshi's wrath. I do encourage everybody to join our Telegram group. It has well over 20,000 people. It's a t.me forward slash orange pill. You have amazing people in there and it's just all orange pilled people. We're all plebs. We're all plebs. We're all, nobody knows how much corn anybody else has, but we're all smash buying together. We're all, um, you know, on this road to Bitcoin Nirvana together. Like we're all there, we're all equal and it's super fun. And there, you'll find a lot of support and 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 just joy and art there. So, you know, I, I encourage anybody to join it if you wanna feel good about yourself. If you wanna get ready for good times, join the Orange Hill Podcast Telegram group. I, I, I second that. Uh, Stacy. I have two questions left, apart from a huge thank you to, to both of you for uh, coming on Toxic Happy Hour. And that is, uh, first of all, which tequila were you drinking that had that specific worm that was so amazing? And that was the first question. Second question, uh, will you guys have a margarita with Puppy and I in Miami? We will definitely have a margarita with you in Miami. And obviously, uh, there is no worm in tequila that is in, um, what's the other one? Mes mezcal. Mes mezcal. It's in mezcal. Oh. So I, you know. Uh, part of our group in our Orange Pill Podcast Telegram group, we also have our Orange Pill Podcast group in Spanish. So we have a huge Mexican mm. following. And I don't want them to get upset with me and rage quit and start throwing corn at me in, in or tortilla and tacos at me in, in our Telegram group. I must make clear that no matter how much tequila you buy, you will not find a worm in it. That's in the mezcal. But I, actually, the <laughs> one I had now that I was drinking was the one from um, George Clooney. So, um, <laughs> Ooh. The, the Dos Amigos or uh, something like that. Clooney's pissed. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Awesome. George Excellent. Clooney. So, um, again, thank you so much, uh, Queen Stacy and Bernie Eccleston. You're my favorite version of uh, Bernie Eccleston. <laughs> Uh, actually, a year ago, I thought you um, actually reminded me a bit more of um, Jean-Claude Van Damme. I don't know if you remember, I was uh, tweeting some of that. There, there we go. Bernie Eccleston in Greenland. Also, the just, just for our audience in Miami, I do also want to make sure that you understand it's not Mexican there. It's mostly Cuban. And so we have to have a yes. mojito or something down there. We have a huge uh, Cuban audience as well in our, in our, in our Telegram group. So... I want to make sure, like, I don't know what the, the inter-rivalries are of the, the drinks and the foods of the various Latin American countries, but it will be a mojito in Miami. Oh, and on that note, as we are watching Der Kaiser, yeah. Bernie Eggleston, Max Kaiser print the dirty fiat currency, I want to remind everyone that what he's doing right now is what the central banks are doing. Do not store more value in that dirty fiat currency because it is a scam to dilute and steal the value of your savings. So be careful of that. I believe Max is saying the same thing. Consider the corn, the Bitcoin, because it's a better, more scarce place to store your value. Thank you so much, Max and Stacy. Appreciate it. Thank you. We love hanging See out. Thank you. See thank you in the you. next one. Bye for now, viewers, and amazing chat. Bye. <laughs>